What are you thinking about playing for us? Um, well, I'm in G. I'm in standard tuning, I should say. Um, I think I'll give you give you something nice and easy that I'm comfortable with because um, yeah, this lockdown's been weird. I'm sure we'll get onto that subject. Some of the uh, harder tunes I play, not practicing for six months. So let's give you. Uh, I like playing Wilson Douglas tunes. I love playing Wilson Douglas tunes. Um, so let me give you one of those. Which one? Uh, um, old old Aunt Jenny with a nightcap on. Let's have a little bit of that. Sounds good. so much uh so this is uh, ben smith over in berlin germany the editor of old time central um and this is our uh live weekly interview series um with old time musicians from around the world and today we have uh steve blake coming to us from london and he started us out with uh, a wilson douglas tune wilson douglas's version of old on jenny with the nightcap on is that right mm -mm. what um what do you love about Wilson Douglas tunes? Um, well, they're kind of, it's like mashed potato or something. They're kind of just solid and, well, mashed potato isn't solid, it's soft, but <laughs> it's like, a you know, it's a basic kind of healthy, kind of suits all occasions kind of food, isn't it? It goes with anything. I feel like Wilson Douglas tunes are a bit like, you know, I don't have to be in a particular mood to listen to a, well, I don't with anything, but if you were the kind of person that might need to be in a particular mood to listen to a certain fiddler or kind of tune, just imagining in a parallel world where old time tunes and fiddlers actually sounded different enough for that, then uh, yeah, Wilson Douglas would be the, the fiddler you could listen to at any moment, I think. It's just, um, yeah, it's funky, but not in a really heavily syncopated way it's just his feel is funky it's just right you know there's there's more syncopated players and there's there's players that play more bluesily but i mean wilson does a lot of slides but those slides don't really feel blues i'm not really into i love the bluesy side of old time but i don't tend to gravitate towards those kinds of tunes myself to play right i tend to gravitate more perhaps to ones that where i can hear the connection with British music a little bit more perhaps, which is yeah. weird because I probably was drawn in by the stuff that sounded more different. Yeah. But someone well, like Natalia or Emmett Lundy, you know, on certain tunes that you, you could almost, almost be listening to Scottish music, you know, this is right. very closely related, you know, a lot of the tunes. So I quite like that. Wilson Douglas doesn't sound like a British player in that way, but um, as I say, he's not particularly bluesy. So I, I like him for that reason. Okay. I like a lot of the well, very simple tunes that he plays, although they're not all simple. You know, like one of the most complicated crooked tunes, Camp Chase, is one of his, isn't it? Hmm. Um, but that's not typical of his, I would say. Hmm. Um, well, why don't we start? Why don't we start a little bit farther back? And um, I'm sure for a bunch of people, whether from over this side of the ocean or in the United States, it's interesting to try and hear why 
uh, and how you got into playing old time anyway? Mm. That's a big question, isn't it, for all of us? What a strange thing to end up doing. <laughs> um, yeah, really. Uh, I don't know how far back to go on that one. I, 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 I was into country music, some country music. My dad was a big country music fan. I despised it, but I loved, I loved the Flat and Scruggs record he had, which would have been when Bonnie and Clyde movie came out and Flat and Scruggs had the Foggy Mountain Breakdown, and I think it was in the charts in the UK even. Would have been on top mm -hmm. of the pops, possibly. And they had an album around that time. And uh, I loved that. And I loved Johnny Cash, um, which is probably, we'd probably agree, is like a lot nearer to old time than a lot of country. Mm hmm sure. Um, well, you've got the connection with the Carter family as well, haven't you, for a start? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, um, yeah, when I hated country, because it was my dad's music, I always loved those things. So that was kind of hovering there. And then, yeah. I started to, when I started collecting a lot of music in my teens, late teens, um, it wouldn't have been in my late teens that I was collecting old time. I was guessing my mid to late twenties, I would have been already picking up in record shops on record covers that caught my eye, looked interesting. So I would have been buying, I started buying a lot of Ahuli records. By my thirties, I was buying a l anything I saw on Ahuli. And that was quite a common occurrence. There was one very good music shop in Stoke Newington, North London, where I lived at the time. And I'd just buy anything. So a lot of those were country blues stuff. But there was starting to, it was starting to filter in. The occasional record on a fair bit of Cajun. Mm -hmm. so I was into that kind of roots music f through my 30s. But then in about my mid-30s, having been a saxophone player prior to this um, and during this, I had taken up drumming, which I'd always wanted to do since I was 11. And my mum and dad would never buy me a drum kit. Fair enough. Um, but it just never <laughs> happened. And then I never lived anywhere where I could have a drum kit set up until I moved to Stoke Newton. We had a big basement in a house that was um, rented to us by, uh, oh, what was his name? Reggae singer. An English reggae singer. I walked down to Electric Avenue. That song. Um, forgotten his name now. Stupid of me. So in this house, I had a drum kit. I was practicing drums. Um, and then suddenly somebody threw me a curveball, And that was by giving me a banjo. It was a friend of my a choreographer I worked with. I make music for dance, contemporary dance. Mm -hmm. And um, the choreographer I worked with, Lee, her boyfriend, Dave, he had some uncles who were quite musical and play. One of them made, one of them makes mandolins. He made, gave me this one. Anyway. Um, Dave found this old banjo that was all broken up in his attic and he just gave it to me. He said, Steve, you play everything. You, you can play this. And uh, I'd never really played a string instrument apart from, you know, bedroom guitar, a few chords like most people. Sure. And um, this banjo was, was the cheapest banjo you can imagine. Nothing fancy. I'm sure it didn't even have a name on it. Um, and I'm With five string working. here. Five strings, yeah, and I put new strings on it, and I put new pegs on it, and a bridge, and everything, and it just about played in tune. Um, and I was just, I was hooked instantly, instantly hooked, and from almost from that moment, that became the main thing I listened to. Huh. Uh, old time, I was just obsessed with collecting old time records. Then I'm 57 now, so and I was about 34, something like that. So okay. I don't know how long ago that was? Um, and do you so, was yeah. it, was it the was it just the sound or was it like no you know, it wasn't just the sound do you do things with it or it wasn't just the sound I already loved the sound my friend uh, Mark Sanders who lived with me at the time in the house constantly uh, is a great free jazz drummer really amazing top top free jazz drummer in London I would say in my in my opinion um, and he gave me a tape which had a whole load of weird old times some bluegrass stuff but quite a lot had it had a guy telling riddles in a very very strong accent um that was incredible and uh, i don't know whether it was an existing compilation that you can buy or whether someone had put it together for him but it had some really weird stuff i remember it had run mountain you know that song j j is it j e minor don't know great tune um 
so I yeah I was already into that sound and as I say I had all the all Hulu records but it was really the banjo when I started to work out how that fifth string worked it just I'd never been able to play a guitar very well but having an open tuning and the right. way that fifth string the rhythmic way that fifth string worked the fact that I was into drumming and right. rhythm yeah I was just hooked I burnt my porridge every single day for I would say a year I would get up, put the porridge on in my dressing gown and uh, just go off and sit down and start playing the banjo while I was waiting for the porridge to cook and then half an hour later there'd be smoke and a terrible smell <laughs> I mean, I'm not okay. Maybe not every day, but I I did that like dozens of times. So do you asso you associate the smell of burnt porridge with playing the banjo? I I would, yeah, I would. And the next door neighbor came round to um to kill me at some point. I remember. I can't. I'm I'm kind of remembering that I was in. I could hear it going on, but I might have just heard the description later. But the guy came round and he was like trying. They were holding him back at the door, and he was looking behind him. Where is he? Where is he? You know, just. He, he'd obviously listened to me play the banjo for five months and then just something clicked one day and <laughs> he'd never seen it. I didn't know he could hear me. Yeah, so I just I just was obsessed. Uh, yeah, God, just loved it so much. Um, so you think it was, I mean, there's a, I guess I don't know how common it is just from, but from anecdotes, um, I certainly know plenty of banjo players who come to it from, percussion from drumming and feel yeah. just sort of a very easy affinity with it as a sort of a, a percussion instrument with strings on it Does yeah that make sense? yeah yeah well i know quite a few drummers that play there's a there's a couple here good fiddlers that that play drums as well um yeah though you funnily it was more when I took up fiddle that I saw the connections with percussion hmm. than when I played the banjo. Because the banjo, yeah, the banjo for me was about working out. It was very much getting used to playing a stringed instrument and that aspect of it and where the notes were and where the notes were in relation with those weird open tunings in relation to the fifth string. And that was what fascinated me more than yeah i mean obviously that music's very rhythmic and as a drummer i loved that but it was it was more with the fiddle that i started to see some very very i still see really close connections with like what what sort of stuff jumped out to you with fiddling yeah well the most obvious one is um so when you practice drums one of the main technique things you practice are paradiddles i guess probably most people listening and probably musicians and probably know this Sure. So the, I mean, they're, they're, they're geared, I guess, towards balancing your left and right hands, feeling accents in different places. So, I mean, the most obvious one that you would play is right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. Sure. Which is basically Nashville Shuffle, isn't it? Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, you know, long, short, short, long, short, short. Yeah. Long, short, short, long, short, short. It's, it's exactly the same thing. Mm, mm, mm. Um, and um, as I said, I was living with Mark Sanders, the great drummer at Stone Newton. We had two drum kits set up in the basement. Him playing his amazing chopsy free jazz stuff and me banging along to Faces Records on the other side <laughs> of the room. <laughs> and... Uh, he told me this fantastic exercise device, which is to take any pattern that you're practicing, any paradiddle pattern or any rhythmic pattern, and shift it along one beat at a time. So you can either perceive it as moving the notes forward in the mm. bar, or you can perceive it as the notes staying where they are and you just move the bar lines backwards. So either way, it's a bit like when the clocks go forwards and backwards, what's happened? Is it forwards or have you lost time going to confuse them? But basically, you just take that pattern, you start it on the next note, and then you start it on the next note. So in the case of right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, you would go right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. Then you would go, you move it along one to the right. Left, right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, right. 
then you move it along one more and you practice right right left right left left right left right so it's all the same pattern it's just starting a different right. place in the bar right but then you take that beyond that because it's not just that paradiddle accent there's lots of there's lots of paradiddles um you know triplet ones right left right left right right left right left right left left you right. can say you can do the same thing to those yeah and then the amazing thing was you then took two limbs so you would play your right hand on the ride for example your left on the snare and then you keep time with your feet so your feet would just be going boom tip boom tip or boom tip boom tip boom to whatever speed you wanted but regular right whilst your hand played the paradiddle pattern and then you would shift it along where your feet would carry on playing the beat you right shift the hand pattern along shift the hand pattern along so when i started playing fiddle i immediately did that so i would practice natural shuffle and i'd move it along one and move it along one you can do it with accents as well so you put an accent in a certain place and you move that accent along you move the accent along right and when you if i recall correctly usually when you're playing fiddle at least you keep time with both of your feet don't you you keep like quarter notes oh, yeah. with one foot and, and eighth notes with another foot yeah it's not always that way sometimes it might be one two one two one two Sometimes it might be one, two, and one, and two. But yeah, quite often it's what you say. Yeah, quite often that foot might be doing that and the other knee is bouncing up, dum, 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 dum. Yeah, bouncing up and down 16th notes, yeah. It depends on, some tunes I just couldn't play if I wasn't doing that. Mm -hmm. The way I played drums, it was very much the feet that held me, held me together and the hands right. that played with that, pulled that about. Right. Um, yeah i've got a little bit better at that um because in kaylee band some of the kaylee bands are in they want everyone to stand up and i can't i could never play standing up because i need those two feet going right it's for non it's for non uk for non uk uh viewers what's a what's a kaylee band yeah like a square dance band so playing for social dancing okay with a caller right uh so i'm in a couple of kaylee bands um one called cut shine but we play american tunes but we don't do square dances necessarily we do some square dances but um yeah we're doing we're doing the scottish repertoire dances but with american music right um, right so it's not it's like square dance in that it's a called social dance but it's not the the yeah the actual less, moves are not the same quite uh, i'm not a caller um I, i've not done a lot of square dances tony mates came across from and did some with us and uh joe bursky who runs cut shine and um plays bass in it sometimes and banjo he plays banjo with um uh jude 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 jude, jude not jude um, greg greg udelman you mean yes yeah greg, yeah <laughs> he lives just he lives a couple of blocks away yeah so uh he he's he's learned some square dances so we chuck them in sometimes right yeah um yeah i'm not sure how closely how much of the square dance repertoire came uh, is related to the yeah the oh, i'm sure it's a, a long and messy history like all yeah which actually so you got into really playing the banjo as an instrument and when did you start getting into the the uk old time community okay so that was, I think it was fairly soon. I mean, I'd played, I was already playing drums. I'd played saxophone for a long time. I've been a professional musician already playing saxophone. So um, it didn't really take me long to learn about it. I'm not saying I was good, but you know, I could play the thing relatively right. quickly. Um, and I bought a nice banjo. I don't know how soon that was. It was probably a few months after I started, let's say six months at the most. It was less, I think. And I bought a lovely banjo, um, Clifford Essex, uh, concert grand, Brit British, made in Bristol in England. Wow. Around um, about 1910, 1920, I think. Can't remember the mm. exact day. It's, mm. uh, it's lovely. It's, it's a bit, it's seen better days. The, the neck's a bit warped and some of the inlay's gone. Um, as long as it plays. So I bought that and. Um, then I started to go to a session that was at the time the only session I think in London that I know of English uh, American session, 
and that was um, in Islington, run by a guy called Frank Weston, who still runs it. Um, really nice singer, guitarist, plays a little bit of banjo too. Um, yeah, and it was a great session, really great. At the beginning, there were a lot of really great fiddlers in that session. Um, yeah. Kate Bissauer, don't know if you know her, she's an American fiddle player that lived in London for a long time. Uh, she lives out in Froome, but yeah, she was around. Um, Robin Gillen was a great uh, fiddler. Um, Mark Wallace, uh, there's a lot of, lot of good fiddlers and uh, and banjo players. And Tom Paley, I have to mention him. Um, sure. so of course, I turned up there. I had no idea who Tom Paley was. And um, I realized quite quickly that everyone respected him quite a lot. They would ask very respectfully when they asked him to play a tune or something. But he never gave an air of being he, he was just such a down to earth and accommodating person so funny so funny and such a brilliant guitarist such a brilliant banjo player and everything yeah so that was super inspiring and they were all so encouraging when i think back you know i had no idea that the music was fiddle led even you know the fiddle was just one of the instruments at that point so i was learning tunes from you know, I was learning to play mostly from probably this one. Look, <laughs> like sure. a lot of people. I mean, how the hell do you work out that stuff without? Yeah, he's, I didn't have anyone around me showing me how to play, so I was learning from books and then turning up and trying to lead those tunes in the session. And I think, I, why aren't you joining in? I know you play this tune. Yeah. Still, anyway, they were very, uh, very encouraging and friendly. It was a great session. Cool. Um. Would you play us another tune? Yeah. What do you got for us? Um, so normally I would just launch into anything, but as I say, this lockdown has been hard. On and off, actually, it was great. I loved it at the beginning. I had a great time. Spent a lot of time with the kids. And, but it's been hard to play. The kids are around. We're in a very small flat here. And uh, when I'm working, I play at work a lot in the time between. Uh, I work at um, Laban Conservatoire of Dance, Trinity Laban Conservatoire of Dance Music, playing dance accompaniment, congas and fiddle in the dance classes. And I practice a lot there. And that hasn't been, that didn't happen during? Well, I decided to try and learn round peak style from brad's book because i could <laughs> never play i could never play tommy tunes people start tommy tunes and of course you can join in one because they've only got f four notes or something a lot of them and right i would play them but i would never right. say i would never lead off any of those tommy tunes because i felt i wasn't doing there was something i didn't know what it was going on right yeah, yeah. so i threw myself into that actually through a lot of this lockdown um, I'm not going to play you any of those, but I can do it now. <laughs> I feel like I can do it. And it started influencing my, um, that round peak style started influencing now all the other tunes I play, which is why I'm messing them up really badly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll stick with these. Uh... It's a tricky, tricky style. Uh, so I'll stick with another, uh, I'll play another, another um, Wilson Tuckers one, shall I? Sure, what do about, it. What about going downtown? <laughs> What was that going to town? Going going down to town. Going down to town. 
Or going downtown. Going downtown, I would probably call it normally. Yeah. So I'm sure the fiddle players out there will be curious about how you how how the how you attach the fiddle to yourself. How did that how did that happen? Well, you know, as I said, I started quite late. Well, I haven't said that. Yeah, I didn't tell you how you I started playing the fiddle. You got the fiddle. Back, should we go back to that in a second? Um, I so I didn't start fiddle till. I don't know, mid forties, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I've already, I'm six foot four. My posture's not great. You know, I'm not that fit, healthy. I spend most of my time playing music. I don't really, I'm playing with my kids. I don't, I don't really keep myself in good shape. The last thing I want to do is start hunching my neck and, you know, I thought I'm just not going to do it. I'm not, it's not, it just, it didn't feel right. I couldn't, couldn't, I didn't really have anyone to show. I just didn't like the idea. Um, and I'd seen old time players play off their arms, obviously. And I tried that and I realized my hand felt very constricted by holding the fiddle there. I wanted, I wanted to be like this. I didn't want to be like this. Um, I can play some tunes like that, but if it goes up the top string, I can't, I can't really do it. I don't know how people do it. It doesn't stay there. So I knew pretty much straight away that I wanted to tie it on somehow. Um, bit of experimentation i think first of all i had a big um like a nappy pin thing not a nappy pin like a popper but a really big one mm -hmm. and uh, i had another little nappy i had another thing that i pinned to my shirt with a popper on and then i just popped it on okay I found it just your clothes just pull it just wouldn't yeah right. it wasn't supported yeah. right so then i had string i've now got elastic so that means when I put it on tightly, I get this elastic so it just fits over my head and then it doesn't pull too far away. Um, I need to, and then what happened then was it ended up sitting too much in the middle. Right. So I couldn't really play on the bottom string right. Right. Um, and I wanted it more at that angle. So I've got another piece of string so this piece is tied round fairly central around the tailpiece and around the tailpiece and the inside part of the chin rest. Yeah. And the other string is tied to make it more over there is tied just round the chin rest. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that goes up to my arm here. Mm -hmm. It's very loose. It doesn't seem like it's doing anything, but it just does enough. Just pulls it over there a little bit, and it also stops it. Pivoting when you push down on the top on the E string, right, right, yeah. Um, so that, yeah, I find that very comfortable, very relaxed. I can look around, talk in the sessions, right. Um, I feel like I'm it's playing drum kit like I was comfortable with before. I'm not playing this weird alien classical thing. I, yeah, I just have no interest in that at all. Right. Um, yeah, there's a downside. If you're in a session in a bar, you know, I can't be bothered to take it on and off sometimes. So I end up going up to the bar, and <laughs> out. <laughs> going to the toilet with it on. Um, and how and how did you get to playing the fiddle? Uh, so I had no... The same with the banjo. I had no urge to play a stringed instrument. I was playing drums happily and, until someone gave me one. And I had no urge to play the fiddle. It didn't occur to me I would be a fiddle. What a ridiculous endeavor, you know, in your mid forties to start playing the fiddle. It just seems stupid. Um, but then uh, back to Tom Paley. I'm sat with Tom Paley in, in the session one day. And he was always very encouraging and supportive about my banjo playing. I was, I was okay on the banjo, you know. And uh, he, he said to me one day after I'd, we'd finished a tune, maybe I'd been leading, I don't know. And he turned to me and he said, you know, Steve, you'd make a pretty fine fiddler. And of course, I was just like, ah, really? Okay. <laughs> hmm, really? And, uh, and then maybe six months later, because I'd been mulling it over, six months later, I was at Gainsborough Festival. Tom had his stall of fiddles set up there <laughs> and he sold me one. <laughs> uh, 
And I remember when I bought it, I thought, I'm not ready to play this. 500 quid it cost at the time, which wasn't that cheap, I suppose. But mm -hmm. it's the cheaper end of things. Um, and I knew I wasn't going to play it when I bought it. I just thought, I'm not quite ready for this. But I'll buy it, and I'll take it home, and I'll stick it on the shelf. And it'll be there when I'm ready to start playing. It'll be there. You know? Okay. So I did actually, I mean, I, it, it, it was around for quite a while. And then when I did decide to start playing, oh, just to finish the Tom Paley thing, a few years later, quite a lot of years later, maybe 15 years later Ed Hicks I'm sure you know or you do know I'm sure, sure many people know he's a great banjo player here in London he um, he's a great instigator of uh, a lot of learn old time um, learning workshops and things yeah um, I was telling him this story of Tom Paley saying you'd make a pretty fine fiddler and Ed said Tom had said exactly the same exactly the same words to him, and then sold him a fiddle as well. I said, <laughs> so it might have been, it might have been some combination of encouragement and a sales technique. Definitely, definitely, yeah. Um, That's funny. Yeah, he was a funny. He was so funny, and then um, he had a filthy sense of humor. Absolutely filthy. <laughs> the dirtiest jokes I've ever heard. He would tell me in the session. Um, anyway. The fiddle sat at home for a while and then when it came to play it i just thought i don't know how to even begin to get all that syncopation i don't want to be worrying about that so i'll just play english music to start with okay there was an english session i'd heard down the road and it all seemed much easier ploddy i mean it's it's got its challenges sure and you can obviously you can do anything well or as well as you want to right so i'm not going to say it's easier but it's easier in some ways it was easier for me um, so I started to go to an English session, um, same story, very friendly people, very encouraging a chap called John Offord was a regular at that session. He lives actually, I didn't find this out too later, but he's my neighbor. Um, he, I'm just going to advertise his book. Am I allowed to do that? Of course. Because this book might be of interest to your viewers. Um, He's, he's, he's put out three books now, but this, this one is very, very interesting. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. John of the Green, the Cheshire Way, and it's triple time hornpipes. Mm -hmm. um, and triple time hornpipes are basically 3-2 is the time signature. So they're in three, but it's not like a waltz where the three is quite fast. The three is much slower. Yeah. And it's as if you're playing in four, where you've got groups of four. Uh, so if you're in four, it's like dagger, 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 dagger. Mm -hmm. So in three, two, it's like dagger, 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 dagger. Mm -hmm. Rather than boom, da, da, boom, da, da. Right. So often when you hear a three, two tune that you don't know, because they're so weirdly syncopated as well, you think right. you're hearing a tune in four, and you'll think this is the crookedest tune I've ever heard. And then suddenly you hear it where the bars are. Right. It's like any other fiddle tune. It's got really clear patterns. Right. Sure. But this 3-2 uh, hornpipe, they're called, um, was, I believe, the most common dance music rhythm um, at one point. You know, Interesting. I don't know when. Do you know any? Or something. Hmm? Can, you, can you play us one? Oh. Uh, well, I, am I in costume? Uh I don't play English music anymore, so it would be terrible. But yeah, like, uh, um, oh, let me think. Uh, um, yeah. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Thank you. 
Yeah, that's actually a modern tune written by, uh, I've forgotten his name, Kirk Patrick, plays the um, concertina. But yeah. Okay. But that's the feel. But those tunes were pretty much um, forgotten and not really played at all until John put this book out. And mm. then a whole bunch of uh, young English bands recorded some of his tunes from this book. On the and suddenly, like everyone was playing them, and they're 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 back in the repertoire again, which is great. Mm. Um, so, how did you make it then finally to old time fiddle? Um, well, I was really enjoying playing English, and the English at that time the English sessions were good. It's very different from in an American session. It can become it's 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 like. Uh, I forgot, I've forgotten the phrase, but you're you're losing out as people are added, aren't you? Often the, the idea is just three of you, a banjo and a guitar. And, you know, suddenly you've got three guitars and four banjos and um, I just uh, turn this off. Yeah, English sessions are great with a lot of people. You know, if you're in a session where there's loads of fiddles and too many guitars is never a good thing, but you know, you maybe you've got Finishing a euphonium and you've got a bass clarinet and you've got people playing melodians and I mean, you have to have good players. If there's lots of bad players, it's bad, but sure. it can be a very rousing sound, a big English session. Mm -hmm. So I, I loved it. Um, and uh, yeah, it was quite a while before I started playing American stuff, I think. Um, I don't remember. I don't. Yeah, I don't remember when I finally decided to hmm. start doing it. But at some point, it became you went down the rabbit hole, as one of my friends said, and that you yeah you got pretty into it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's very addictive, isn't it? I mean, it's so the fiddle's so challenging, and if you enjoy that challenge, then uh, yeah, it gets rid of it. Eats up a lot of boredom, doesn't it? <laughs> Fam family happening at the same time um well it seems like though that it's i don't know i guess i'm classifying it seems like there are some people who get into it just because they're around other uh people who can really teach them and so there's that relationship there and they're just really into a particular style or somebody who's going to teach them yeah. And then there are some people who really get into it as a kind of, I don't know, study, I guess. There's almost kind of a, you know, like a fascination with diving into different players and like the yeah. minutia of, of what's going on. Yeah, it, was, it would have been nearer that end for me because, um, like I say, way back at the earlier session, I was definitely inspired by people like Tom. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not the kind of person that I very rarely go to workshops. I can see that they're good and why they're good for other people. But yeah, I just, I can learn quick at home, but I can only learn quick in my own way. And I find I'm struggling to follow what's going on. Someone's bowing different from me. I want to know what they're doing, but I don't have time to assimilate it. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I've, always, I've always done it with old recordings. That's how I learned. It right. wasn't really... It was more about an overall sound of what old time sounded like to me. I was, I was, I won't pretend that I could hear any stuff. Well, I still probably can't really hear regional styles as well as some people. I guess now that I've, yeah, I mean, Tommy Gerald sounds very different from any from other players, doesn't he? And the people that learn from him are at Round Peach style. I can hear that, but yeah, you know, between Kentucky and West Virginia, I don't necessarily hear. Or even within those states, you know, people sound very different, don't they? Most well, they do, yeah. They sound super different. Uh, I mean, just for me, I, I never really picked up on that. So it was more just about the technicalities of how to get something like that sound out of my fiddle. Right. Um, but you would get sort of fascinated with the sound of a particular fiddler and then want to figure out... Because, in, in, like, who else... You're also really into John Ashby... That, right? well, that came a lot later and he's not typical of the kind of tunes I like because he's quite fluid isn't he and he plays with yeah. a really nice sound and intonation I mean at the beginning it's weird isn't it how you're you know what you're aiming for changes 
your goals change a lot as you play because at the beginning I just wanted to sound like the roughest you know most esoteric kind of field recordings that I could find that I, I had you know I loved that just like this sounds like it comes from a different world and a different time and yeah. I wasn't really after a slick polished sound at all but then of course as you get into it you realize there's a huge amount of technique going on in you know in the recordings that you thought were you know somehow rough I mean they're only rough right. in certain ways this is you know like with Tommy Jarrell for example you know sure like it's just like but I've always been very dubious about that whole idea of feel in music. You know, some people have good feel and some people don't. Mm -hmm. And like, I mean, it's true, but I don't think feel is something that's like, it's, it's just another aspect of technique to me. Some okay. People, some people can learn that aspect of technique easily. Yeah. And other people can't. But I think those, the people that don't learn it easily can still be, taught that i think right um to some extent uh yeah but i used uh i've always used the um slow downer for for using for, for learning i was really into salia tunes for a long time uh -huh. and yeah and tunes um Do you play as one of your favorites from when you were when you were getting started out Okay, let me see. Oh, perhaps I'll retune. Can I just retune? Yes, you can. Half a full time, isn't it? Retuning. Facebook is amazing, isn't it? The old time, it's like a village, isn't it? A worldwide village we're in. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Um, people have been very helpful on there as well. Um, um, chap called Rusty, I'm sure many people, listeners will know, Rusty Night, Nighthammer, Neathammer, Nighthammer, sent me a whole bunch of um, Bruce Green tunes way back. Mm. Uh, I really like Bruce Green's sound. And uh, I was talking to Rusty about that, and he just said, oh, you might like these. Right. Suddenly about They're crazy. About like, 50 hours worth of music appeared. <laughs> Let's stop. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'll play one of his, which I've since found is a Jim Bowles tune. Okay. A, Bruce Green, a tune you learned from a Bruce Green recording. I learned it from the Bruce Green re recording. I never, what is really, it? I never really amended it. Sometimes I'll, if I find an earlier source for something, then I'll kind of learn that as well and lean towards that. But I didn't with this one. Yeah. Cool. Okay. What's it called? Uh, Calico. Oh, yeah. So cross A. I'm playing in cross G. Okay. Yeah. More, more I, will be. I will be if we don't run out of time. Well, no, we're good. So this is a tune that I used to play a lot and used to like and then stopped because I felt like I wasn't bowing it right. And like, as I say, I've been learning the Tommy Jarrell tunes. So uh -huh. some of the stuff I've absorbed from that, I've started to apply to earlier tunes that I wasn't happy All with. Right. So this is probably one of those. Um, I know it's not a round peak tune, but... Thank you. 
Nice. <laughs> that was funky. Yeah, I'd like to play a bit faster, but a bit rusty at the moment. I haven't played in a session for... Yeah, I find sessions really do help with your speed, don't they? I mean, some tunes don't need to go fast. I'm, I'm, I never aspired to be a fast player. Right. Some tunes I like a lot slower than a lot of people play them, but that one is nice, a bit pacier. Yeah. yeah. So what has... You haven't played in a session in a while? What's 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 been going on during during these crazy corona times? in london or the uk generally yeah well just trying to keep the kids happy really here um yeah i lost all my work completely um yeah i mean on the whole i had a lot of time to play with the kids we did a lot of home learning um out on the trampoline with them every day going out for walks um yeah just really really good towards them for most of it but mm. we just got worse and worse at that after a while. And um, everyone started doing their own things, kids staring at the iPads. I'm glad they've gone. Stan has gone back to school today, thank goodness. Um, Vivi starts in uh, primary school on Friday. That's my daughter. She's four. Mm. Um, and yeah. what about work at the conservatoire? Has that started again too? Well, they've been paying me throughout but I didn't do many hours there anyway, so that's not been a great help. I got some fun from the Arts Council. I have to apply for a second batch. But uh, no, I mean, just lost so much work. I mean, half, more than half my work was playing at the weekends for weddings and things. Right. And gigs. Well, the Old Time Wasters gigs never paid, really, unless it was... A, <laughs> yeah, I mean, a festival would maybe the most we'd get, and that would be at least half of what we were getting in a Kaylee, you know. So, right. uh, yeah, it was cut, cut shine, the band I was in, the Kaylee band. Um, we, we were quite busy. So that's been really tough. I don't know when that's going to start. So even in the UK, you can't make money playing all time. <laughs> yeah, you can make literally tens of pounds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, you know, I play, I play at the conservatoire. I play old time tunes for the dance classes uh no one's complained yet <laughs> yeah they haven't gone to the ombudsman and been like what's this guy doing <laughs> yeah. we, well so uh, that's also i mean a question i've always been very interested in which is you know there, there you've played lots of different kinds of music throughout your life and you still play different kinds of music why why do you continue to spend so much time playing all time? Uh, so I don't really play other types of music. Um, I, I write music for a choreographer, a contemporary dance company, which we like, well, we lost our funding about 10 years ago. So we've struggled to make work since then. Uh, I've worked for a couple of other people since, and that's never been up old time or even really rootsy music at all. I keep trying to find an opening where I could use that, but it's just never really applicable. Um, um, but I don't play that. That's just what I do for work when I'm making soundtracks for something. Mm. Uh, it's not like I have a band that goes out and plays that stuff. Right. Um, I don't play drums anymore, apart from congas at the dance school. So, I, yeah, I only play old time now. Um, well, you guys play old time for Cut of Shine as well? or Yeah. I said, you just show up to a Kaylee and play American music. Yeah. They don't nice. know any difference. People don't right. know any difference. Occasionally, if they've specified they want Scottish, you know, if it's like a Scottish wedding and they, they, they want Scottish music, we'd either say, that's not what we do, or we, you know, they might say, oh, that's all right. Can you put some Scottish tunes in and we, we can play a uh -huh. Scottish tunes. But or you just play the old time tunes and start them off by saying, this is a this is an obscure Scottish tune from... Well, unless you're a real aficionado or a player, is you know fiddle music for dance is, is it serves the same purpose doesn't it really right, yeah um, that's what makes it a lot of the old time good. tunes you know a lot of the old time tunes as i say sound quite scottish perhaps um and most people mostly people wouldn't notice they probably think they most people in britain probably think you're playing irish music that's what they think they probably don't they're not aware that there's other fiddle traditions probably anyway can I tell a little story, which is that, you know, we over here in Berlin, we play, you know, we often have jams 
in parks if the you know if the weather's nice then we'll just meet up a lot you know several of us have kids or whatever it's just nice to play outside we live in apartments so we don't have gardens so we often just play in the park and pretty frequently people will come up to us and say oh i love irish music like and that like that's 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 their starter like that's you know they'll they'll be and then we have to either we used to explain to them and now we don't explain to them anything we're just yeah, like yeah no it's no it's no point is there but the but last what was it like two weeks ago because you know the whole corona thing in berlin is seemingly well under control i guess i don't know but like you know life is pretty life is pretty normal here so we've been able to play um about two weeks ago three or four of us were sitting in the park again playing old time and this guy walked up to us and, and said, oh, you guys are playing old time, right? And we were like, yeah. He's like, oh, okay, because I, I was looking for an Irish session that's supposed to be somewhere here. <laughs> Someone had obviously told him that you that there was an Irish session. That was probably was you. Yeah. Well, what we get a lot is people saying, they'll say something like, can you play you know, some some pop record that had a bit of fiddling back in the 80s or something. Uh, uh. And you'll say, oh, we don't really know that one. And they 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 just don't get it. They just won't believe you. They just think you're being really mean and awkward. They, right. They, they right. Seem to think, right. they think that musicians just play music, that we've learned to play music and then we can just play any music. It's like, you don't, it's like, no, right. no, we don't know the, the chords to that tune. It's like, what are right. chords? Just, just play the tune. Don't be so selfish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. We had a bit of a session in the park, um, in a cemetery, Tower Hamlets Cemetery in East London. Uh, a few of us tried to get that going mm. uh, a couple of months ago, but um, because otherwise, you've have you been you've been running a session, or are you just a, a stalwart there for many years? Yeah, we have our own session. Um, the old time wasters but it's pretty much like the old time racers rehearsal with a couple of other people joining in um, John Tolbert nice fiddler comes fairly regularly oh, he's done his shoulder in so he can't play now which is a has he? oh my god what oh, he's, yeah, he's, he's, he's a ridiculous he's a bit better when he started playing again and now it's bad again he's decided to completely stop playing till it's better which is just oh, he's, he's really positive about it but that's good um and uh, David from Italy. I don't know if you've met him. I'm not sure. Regularly, but mostly it's just the three of us. Um, I don't the know. I think I got a bit of a reputation for playing really, really terrible, really crooked tunes and things. And uh, so not many people come to our session. They probably think we just play really fast, crooked tunes. <laughs> There's some truth to that, isn't there, Steve? Well, I did used to like crooked tunes. I, I would avoid playing them in sessions now. But what really bugged me about it is, um, you know, you get this reputation and then everyone would go away to Sore Fingers workshops and come back and they'd learn a tune from Aaron or Virgil Eddy that was crooked and suddenly they're all playing it in the session. It's just like, it has to be validated by somebody for it to be. Oh, I see, yeah, I see. You can't just turn up and start playing this tune. It's like, it's like they think, oh, it's really obscure tune. It's only obscure because you don't know it and you haven't listened to the source recording of it. But right, right. Yeah. Anyway, let's not get into sour grapes. So I got a bit of a reputation for playing crooked tunes. I think. I don't know. I I don't really play them anymore. I like you've heard the ones I have played tonight. I like really yeah. straightforward. Yeah, yeah. Crooked tunes now. Um, although, uh, yeah, some of those. Uh, some of the crooked um, Wilson Douglas ones are great. Old Mother Flanagan. Have you heard his Old Mother Flanagan? I don't know. Do you want to play it for us? Or is it in cross? They play it. They play it in. Uh, they play it everywhere. They play it in. Uh, I, I actually, I think it's probably in G, so I can't play it. Uh, yeah, it's in G. I can't play it for you. Okay. Yeah. Never mind. Huh. So there's been uh not a lot of playing and not a lot of festivals for the past several months oh it's been hell hasn't it just just really makes you realize how special all of that is 
Mm. You're meeting up at festivals. It's such a beautiful thing. God, what a lovely scene we're in. It really is so amazing. I missed it so, so, so much. Isn't it just going to be the greatest party when it's, when it starts up again? <laughs> it's going to be so good. Are we going to be able to play any tunes or are we just going to sit there and, and uh, smile at each other and drink beer and... Well, whatever. Revel in the fact that we can do it again. Maybe a few tunes. We've Maybe got some things starting up. We've got... Um, a uh, great fiddle and banjo player from down in Brighton called Dan Stewart is having a get together in a field. Nice. Uh, next weekend or the weekend after? Maybe next uh -huh. weekend. Um, so that'll be lovely. Really looking forward to that. Yeah. And uh, friends of our American Old Time Music and Dance, which is uh, the organisation that run a lot of the festivals here in the camps. Right. They've slipped in an extra camp because not many people could make it to the summer camp so they've slipped in an extra one in a couple of weeks i probably won't be able to go that because i've yeah i've already um, been away for the i will have been away for dan's weekend so i feel a bit guilty to leave my wife stranded with the kids two weekends in a row but, right uh, it's a bit far to take them in the car it used to be up in leicester and it's moved to over towards wales mm. gloucestershire tewkesbury i think uh, but that's starting up again. So we're getting a bit cold for camping, though, I think, now. Yeah. Well, over this way, I, I know the, uh, at least the plan right now is for the, the Danish old-time gathering, Katinga, which has been happening for a couple decades, at least, is, is still happening this year. So we'll see what happens, how many people show up and what it's like. So I guess we'll just have to hope for the best. Yeah. Yeah, I just... So, uh... This has been a lot of fun. Thank you very much for making time for us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for inviting me on here. It was very cool. Yeah, yeah very our cool. pleasure. Um, would you have a tune that you'd like to play us out on? Uh, yeah, I could play something. Um, These mics, by the way, a friend lent it. It's called an AccuSound. Mm -hmm. It's very good. Very mm. good for recording. Yeah, I great. I think string quartets use them. They're quite pricey, you know, maybe 250, 300 quid. Okay. But, um, yeah, really nice. Nice, excellent. Right, half the sound's out. Half is this uh, other thing over here. But, sure. Um, yeah, what no. should I play? Uh, how about... Um, Another one, another one I got from Bruce Green. So there was about two years where all I did was learn from these Bruce Green recordings that Rusty had sent me. Uh, With two years. Um, so this one, I just found out today by looking on uh, Bruce Green. Because I got this from a bootleg, but Bruce plays it on that River of Time CD. Okay. And I just looked on there today. It's from a guy called Wellesley Chrisorn. I think. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Wellesley Chrisorn um, from North Carolina. But uh, I got it from Bruce Green. Yeah, it's uh, sheep, Sheeps in the Meadow and Cows in the Corn. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. 
Very nice. Thank you so much. Another one that should probably go a bit faster, but uh, that's all right. Okay. When the lockdowns ended. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm not sure if we're still live, but either way, uh, Steve Blake, thanks so much for making time to talk with us, and no, I hope thanks. we can do this in person sooner rather than later. Oh yeah, I really hope so. Yeah, yeah. It's great <laughs> to right. see you, Ben. Anyway. Yeah. Thanks a lot, man. See you later. Glad things are, glad things are going well in uh, Germany. That sounds great. Yeah. yeah it's okay.